Good afternoon. Happy to be here to uh, talk about something close to heart, my heart at least, which is uh, rare earth elements. Spent uh, quite a few years getting close to them and uh, trying to understand them better. But one of the things that I really wasn't exposed to was uh, what happens to those rare earths after we dig them out of the ground. And what's the impact on the world, on Africa, and on South Africa particularly. Hence, the relevance of rare earths to, to South Africa. I take a circuitous route to get here. Have to look at the geology a little bit. We have to look at the uses a little bit and then look at the markets and the demand and the supply to understand what's happening in today's um, rare earth world. And it is becoming increasingly, sorry to say this, uh, it's not just platinum and and, and, uh, and other precious metals, but rare earths are becoming a way of life for us. And every year there's uh, almost an, uh, certainly a geometric increase in the amount of rare earths used in our technologies. I won't waste time on that. That's for anybody who might look at the presentation later. So again, referring to the year of the periodic table, it's very also close to my heart. It's one of the things that uh, took time to learn. But uh, the opaque ones were always the lanthanides and the actinoids. Or as they are called now, the lanthanoids more precisely. So these are 15 elements and they're all compressed between barium and hafnium. And they're compressed in there because of something called the lanthanum or lanthanoid contraction. So I won't get into that. but Consequently, they all tend to have um, similar uh, chemistry to a certain extent, um, but quite different uh, physical characteristics uh, in terms of magnetism, optical, and luminescence. So they're not rare per se, and this is one of the things that uh, always comes out. People ask, why are they called that? They're called that for other reasons because they're not actually very rare and in fact some of the abundances of, of the trio, the total rare earth oxides, is comparable to carbon which is sitting around 200 parts per million. So they're widely distributed in low concentrations and again what we face as exploration people uh, all the time is trying to find out where they're concentrated and how can we get at them and is it economical to, to mine them, uh, beneficiate them and turn them into products that we use in our everyday lives. Reeds are very reactive and they're not very noble. Uh, they're easy to dissolve and they, and they precipitate easily and, and there's a lot of things that can happen with them. Chemically they're promiscuous and we'll see that a little later on. But one of the important takeaways here is that reeds each have different optical and magnetic properties. And that's one of the reasons why they're so important to our high-tech industries now. So collectively, REES, um, because of their physical and chemical affinities uh, and the demand that's required f uh, of those elements, uh, this determines their criticality. And this is another key point that we'll see later on, where we don't necessarily want to look at 15 rare earth elements, we only want to see perhaps five of the really important ones, the ones that have value to us. Rare earths occur in over 250 minerals, and I'll show you a slide on that shortly. And uh, the abundance of rare earth elements um, varies anywhere from 10 to 70 percent in those, in those uh, minerals. Of course, we want to look at the, the ones with higher abundances and the minerals that allow us to, to separate the rare earths more easily than others. 95% of rees occur in three minerals, bastnazite, monazite, and xenotime, although many other minerals are economically mined in, in certain situations. Uh, one distinction to make here is that when I talk about TREE, -E, total rare earth elements, or TRIO, total rare earth oxides, 
we can subdivide those into the light rare earth elements and the heavy rare earth elements. So similarly, if we see LREE, -E, it's light rare earths, and then HREE -E is heavies. The distinction is quite important for the economics of rare earth elements. So despite going through every point on this, but I want to give you a foundation of what kind of materials we're looking at. The lower two points are important to the end thesis of this, of this talk. So it's not possible to selectively target just one specific uh, rare earth element from the others. We must mine all of them uh, together and then invest money, time and effort to separate them, to take them away. I think um, this particular slide just gives an idea of the abundance. We have the rare earths in the red circle and they're sitting up very close to the actual rock forming uh, elements in terms of abundance. On the, uh, the y-axis, it's, it's abundance measured in atoms of, of element per, per 10 million atoms of silicon. So it's not really something that's intuitive to, to us, but it's just relative placement that we can see on this slide. There's at least, now jumping to a little bit about rare earth uh, element deposits, which will segue into a slide or two on exploration. There's at least 800 known rare earth deposits in the world, of which only 49 of them have code compliant resource estimates. So if I was obeying the code compliancy here, I wouldn't have called those 800 deposits. So they're more likely rare earth occurrences um, if you really want to get technical and, and split hairs. But it also tells you that there is a lot of rare earths, but only a few of them in abundance and concentration that we can mine. Um, I won't go into the different uh, types, that's for another day, because you could spend several talks just speaking to how the rare earths form, their genesis, their emplacement, and their, their, their alterations. For exploration, I don't know what split we have here. My understanding was that we're talking to manufacturers. But from a geologist's point of view and exploration, there's a number of steps that you can go through. I'm not going to go through these now, but it's there for your future reference. And on this slide, in terms of targeting, there's many parameters that we use for specific targeting of different um, rare earth deposits. But in most, most cases nowadays, we're targeting the heavy rare earths and yttrium as opposed to the light rivers. Most of our demand and use right now is still focused on some of the light rivers, including neodymium, praseodymium, samarium, um, but the focus is shifting onto the heavy rivers more and more because we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have substantial reserves of light rivers known. This slide just gives a, a brief and very simplistic view at, at global exploration. And on the bottom is listed the, the different types of, of deposits. And you can see that there's a fairly equal distribution over most of the world. A lot of the deposits that, that uh, have, have been uh, di discovered since 2011 have been in Russia, which would you know, even out the distribution in that area. <clears throat> this is global rare earth resources by country and deposit type. The central circle there gives an idea of the, uh, of the deposit type. So gar carbonatites are, are very big, about 62% of, of, uh, of the rare earth, global rare earth total is in carbonates. And uh, then a variety of other lesser deposit types. And again, this is a, a study in its own right. <clears throat> on the outer ring, um, it splits it into a national or, or country uh, share of the total rare earths. And the takeaway here is 
China sitting there with 35% uh, dwarfing many of the other uh, countries that do produce. Global re uh, rare earth resources by trio breakdown. Um, I did say that they don't occur in equal abundances. Uh, typically the, the, the light rare earths are quite a bit more abundant than the middle rare earths and the heavy rare earths and that's shown in this, this uh, pie chart showing cerium at the bottom of, of some 48% of all of, the, all of the rare earths. But the really goodies are the ones at the top where we have europium, terbium, holmium, dysprosium, uh, neodymium particularly. Although neodymium tends to have uh, anomalously high uh, comparative content. Now moving down from global into rare deposits in, in Africa, this map gives you a general idea of the not occurrences necessarily, but deposits that are uh, of interest. So in South Africa, we've got Glenover, which is a carbonatite. We've got Steenkamskrill, which is a phosphate. And we also, and we have um, uh, Zan Kopstrift, which is also a carbonatite related deposit. Those are, those are close by. We'll look at these proximities a little later on. But in a number of the countries in Southern Africa, we also have good sized deposits with a variation of light re and heavy re uh, 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 mineral potential. When we plot the total rare earth percent versus the uh, total trio over contained uh, rio, um, this plot just gives an idea of the, the comparative value so Steen Calm Scroll is sitting up um, much higher percentage. It's in fact probably the highest grade rare earth deposit that we know of in the world at this point. And, um, and the carbonatites tending to be lower grade and, and higher, uh, higher uh, tonnage at the end of the day or higher contained rare earths at the end of the day. So we get a full range from low tonnage high grade to high tonnage low grades. In terms of usage, um, we've already seen this with uh, Professor Nex that um, rare earths like other rare metals um, have high tech uses and particularly for the rare earth minerals this has been uh, commercialized and marketed quite a bit that they occur in your iPods, your, your cell phones, uh, particularly in wind turbines where you can have several hundred kilograms of, of rare earths, hybrid vehicles, uh, high energy or high efficiency uh, fluorescent and LED lights as well. Um, there's particularly uh, applications for diverse uh, defense uh, uses as well. So one of the points to remember here is that neodymium iron boron magnets is one of the users of the rare earths and then it itself is used in a variety of other applications including uh, batteries and, and as I said a variety of uses of, of magnets. I won't look really too much at the this distribution of global rare earth production. Um, in 2016 it was 126,000 tons. Most of that came from China numbers range from 84 to 90 percent depending on the year um, and that is also supplemented to up to 20 percent of, of that amount again from China as illegal or, or off quota productions. So the total value though of worldwide products containing rare earths is at least 1.5 trillion US dollars. This slide is really to give you, again, a better idea of what's going on with the re-permanent re magnets. Um, a lot, uh, some 80% of the uh, value of, of the rare earths uh, is incorporated into magnets using only about 20% of the, of, the, of the materials. Um, this consumption is growing at anywhere from 6 to 12% per annum which is which is 
a very dramatic um, increase of use and potentially sustainable, um, but certainly not just from China in itself. So the major use of critical rare earth oxides shown here, and if you can keep these ones in mind, is for neodymium, praseodymium, dysprosium, terbium, and samarium. <coughs> and these we can group as the critical rare earth oxides or critical rare earth elements as the, the, the creos. So global resupply is expected to increase exponentially to try and meet the current and future global demands from rare earth, uh, rare earth dependent technologies and applications. I think we've gone through this, so I won't. It's, it's really a slide that just shows the specific use of the different heavy and light rare earth elements in the variety of different applications. So it's there for reference and obviously in phones. In terms of the um, jumping from exploration to, to uh, processing and mining of rare earth elements, I put in the uses there to dig it, just give a bit of a break in, 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 the, in the talk. But I can sum it up in one page here without even reading everything here. It takes a lot of dollars for exploration, drilling, pitting, sampling, mini bulk samples, a bunch of specialist studies that look at all of the samples that you've taken and the context from where you've taken them. And that enables you to understand what kind of resource that you have and possibly what kind of resource to reserve conversion you might make later on. In addition to that, when we're doing studies, anything from scoping studies to pre-feasibility studies to uh, bankable feasibility studies, we must add in a bunch of other information, including all of the design work from the engineers, um, uh, looking at the environmentals behind it, the hydrogeological uh, models become important from a social context because we can't use up water in, in dry areas, for example, as well as dealing with potential liabilities in mining and that can come from deleterious elements and most particular for parts well for for many rare earth deposits is that there's naturally occurring radioactive materials there that can create uh, difficulties specifically from uh, proximity and mining uh, but also to the uh, public concern with with waste of those of those uh, radi radioactive materials. Processing the ore, this is a very simplistic view of a very complex metallur metallurgical um, uh, concern, um, particularly amongst most of the high dollar uh, commodities, uh, mineral and element commodities, rare earth processing has posed the greatest technological and chemical challenges. So the simple picture though is that we crush up the rock, then we grind it even smaller, and then we use the physical characteristics of that ground material to separate it further down to remove the rare earth bearing minerals. We can then take those, that concentrate of monazite or bastazite or xenotime, those rare earth bearing minerals, and we can do some hydrometallurgical work to break it down into um, a, a, a rare earth carbonate or a rare earth chloride and then from that begin the actual separation process of the individual rare earth elements. Once they're separated by uh, typically um, ionic or, or solvent extraction methods, we can take those separated powders and then convert them into metals and then the metals can be combined with other metals to make alloys and it's the metals and the alloys that are the the end product for the most part of the whole process uh, mining and processing of the ore. All right so stepping away into more uh, difficult terrain for me, but I'll try and keep it a bit short, although I'm going to skip over some slides. 
fundamental to the world situation with rare earths right now is, is China's domination. And China's dominating the rare earth uh, production and use of rare earths, mainly because it's got it's, it's, it's taken on and firmly believes in this mind-to-market concept. So what that means is that they have created a fully integrated value chain from mining all the way through processes, processing into the final uh, um, materials that are used by end users in manufacturing to make all of the, the cars and the vehicles and the lights and the and the computers and, and your cell phones. And that process for China actually took several decades to do. And that's, that's one of the main points of what we'll look at here shortly is that there's an opportunity for companies to try and do the same thing, but it's not going to be easy. This was one mine to market fully integrated model by a now extinct junior exploration company. They had the right idea, but they didn't understand how difficult it was to take conceptualization to reality. And they didn't, they didn't pass on because of this, but, but at least they made an effort and it was one of their marketing ploys for their, for their stock to show that they were trying to emulate what the Chinese have been doing for a long time. We already talked about critical rare earth elements. I won't deal with that any further. One important thing is rare earth basket pricing. And this is fundamental to the success of any producer um, or any mine for that, right? <clears throat> you have to know what you can produce and what you're going to get for it at the end of the day. So the simple story here is, um, depending on whether you're looking at light rare earths or heavy rare earths, um, or the type of mine that you have and where it's located, you need to um, not try and put a price to every one of the rare earths you're going to produce. You only put it to those four or five that will be economically producible through that entire ore processing um, um, flow chart that we just looked at and 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 also to keep in mind that what kind of product are you are you going to to market so if you're in the middle of the Congo I'm just picking country at random and you have this beautiful ore deposit but you have no infrastructure and and very little um, uh, expertise you can go mine it and put it on a boat and take it down to a port where they'll they'll start breaking it down they'll start processing for it processing the ore for you problem is is you're not going to get very much money for the ore so wherever you f end up fitting on the chart at the bottom here the more you can do the value add the more you can charge for your product and the more demand there will be for your product as well so this is fundamental to the mines to market concept. So at the top, that's basically a 55% uh, monazite concentrate. And at the bottom end member, you've got a custom rare earth alloy. At the top, you might get $10, $10 a ton. Now you won't even get that. You'll get considerably less, you'll get about $1.50 per ton. Whereas on the bottom, you can get um, tens of thousands per kilogram, depending on how exotic your alloy is. This just shows global ore value versus basket price. Just your attention onto the green circles. Those are actually the South African mines that I mentioned at the start of the talk. The purple circles are Southern Africa. So they all plot pretty much in the middle. Uh, Steen Cam Scroll being exemplary uh, has the highest rare earth oxides, uh, highest rare earth ore value rather, um, although its basket price is, is, is not the highest. <clears throat>